Well, in Live on Live this Tuesday and Wednesday, we're rounding up our series looking at the U.S. midterm elections that, of course, are taking place today. Now, a little recap. 435 seats in the United States House of Representatives and 35 of the 100 seats of the Senate are up for grabs. Now, this all comes, of course, as the Republican Party currently has a majority in both houses of Congress. And for Democrats, this is their chance to win back control and rein in the Trump administration's dismantling of Obama-era legislation. Legislation. But the U.S. is economy is doing well under Trump and economics or Trumponomics, and unemployment is also at an all-time low. And his popularity rating is at 39 percent, which for some European leaders that we know is actually a decent rating. Now today I'm joined in the studio by Robert Oliver, who's a political commentator and member of Republicans in France. Robert, you're welcome back to the program. Thanks. It's good to see you again. And good to see you. And indeed, Curtis Young, former chairman of the Black Caucus with the Democrats abroad here in Paris. Curtis, great to have you back again. Thank you, David. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, you're both very welcome to the program today. Um, let's just look at uh, this. I mean, we've been uh, saying this uh, today. Is this really a referendum on the Trump presidency? How about you, Robert? Uh, we'll know tomorrow. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Because we really don't know. Tip O'Neill, who uh, was the Speaker of the House when Ronald Reagan was president and after Reagan got elected uh, the first time, the uh, House went uh, to the Democrat Party and uh, he was famous for saying all politics are local. So in many cases, all politics are local. People are looking at what's going on in their district and who is going to represent them the best. Um, but sometimes you may think that it could be the other way, that maybe it's not local, that there is a bias one way or the other uh, to the recently, in terms in terms of the first midterm election, to the recently elected president. So both could be fair. And, and really, I'm not sure we're going to know until... As I said, maybe tomorrow it's uh, questionable as to how many of these races are going to be too close to call and might take a while to have all the votes counted. And indeed, we are going to be following that. But indeed, talking of votes being counted, I mean, for all of the attacks against Trump's authoritarian tendencies, should I say, and indeed accusations of his administration eroding American democracy, defenders of the president's style could say that his tenure to date has mobilized a previously complacent electorate. I mean, 30 million people have already cast their ballots in early voting, which is a record breaker in comparison to the last midterm elections of, under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. So, um, Curtis, so is there a, a silver lining to the Trump cloud? You know, from, from, from that standpoint, it could be anything that uh, will motivate voters is a good thing. Uh, because, you know, one of the things that we have to... Uh, remind ourselves over and over again is that it is the people's democracy. It's not the politicians' democracy. And so, you know, the less people are involved, then the more the politicians can, can go the way they wish to go. So, yeah, there is the, that silver lining that people are being uh, motivated, people are being activated, people are getting out, and that is always, always a good thing. Now, this is another thing that we're saying. I mean, I mentioned the figures there uh, in the introduction that we have uh, 435 seats in the House, and we've got a third of the seats in the Senate that are up for grabs. But this is really to both of you, but I'll ask it to Robert first, and then I'd like to get your reaction, um, Curtis. Does it really matter if the Democrats take the House as the Senate is the more powerful part of Congress, with like senators holding uh, their seats for six-year terms, as opposed to two-year terms, I believe, uh, for the House? Right. Um, so does it really make any difference? Because the Senate will pretty much stay probably in Republican hands, Bob. Yes and no. Again, sorry to be so wishy-washy. <laughs> but the truth is, uh, with, a, with a party that controls the lower house of Congress, they have great subpoena power. So if the Democrats control the lower house, which is the Congress, they can spend the next few years subpoenaing everybody they want and having lengthy trials and question and answer periods. So um, to that, there, there, there is a uh, possibility of creating a long deadlock sort of thing where mm -hmm. a, lot of, uh, a lot of issues aren't settled or talked about, things like infrastructure and immigration policy that uh, will just get put off for too long of a period. And what about yourself, Curtis? Uh, do, you still, do you think that this is still a very important midterm election for, uh, for the other House? There's, there's no question mm -hmm. uh, that this is an important midterm. Term. Look, what right right now we have it it it, it seems to me from afar we have an, an absentee Congress mm -hmm. I and mean, we have a Congress that that 
is not really doing a lot in terms of taking care of the people's business. I think that's under scrutiny in Florida as well at the yeah, moment. In, in, in Florida, ex exactly. And uh, the, the possibility of, of the Democrats coming away from this with the majority in the House will, as, as Robert suggests, open up the door for some oversight, some well-needed oversight. I'm, I'm not suggesting that, that you know, we want to see a Democratic majority in order to create deadlock, but in order to let us get back to this business of government and governance. Mm. What are we there for? Or a witch hunt, of course, which I believe many Republicans, or especially the grassroots supporters, are worried about, that there will be a witch hunt there. But um, let's have a look at this. Uh, you know, Republican candidates in running for these um, midterm elections, many commentators have said that uh, uh, they've noticed, maybe kind of especially in uh, places like New England, uh, New York, that there's been a shift away from, like, a kind of a distancing from the Trump administration in order to, for them to appeal to the more old school GOP Republicans and electorate. Uh, would you agree, Robert? This happens frequently in every um, election, um, going back even to Bill Clinton when it was the Democrats and some people dis distanced themselves from him, going back to Reagan uh, in the midterms where a number of candidates distanced themselves from Reagan. So this happens quite frequently, and this is no exception this time. It's a little more it's a little more on the front page because uh, Donald Trump is a particular character who's quite polarizing, more so than Reagan and more so than uh, Clinton. And so when you have these things, uh, when this type of thing happens, uh, it's not uncommon for people to try to distance themselves from this one or that one. A similar thing happened with George Bush also. So it, it's true with a number of politicians. Now, you're mentioning there about polarizing. Uh, now there have been complaints about violent campaign ads, uh, like there's one stamping his face with golf spikes and then there was another advertisement that was pulled off CNN and Fox News uh, for racial slurs about the migrants heading up to uh, the Mexican border with the United States. Um, Curtis, have we seen anything like this in previous campaigns? Anything yeah. like yeah. that? Yeah, we have. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this reminds me of, of, of Willie Horton. Uh, of, of that ad. This is a, this is a, this is a comes out of a playbook uh, that was put together at a certain time with the Southern strategy. This was the moment when people who traditionally were Democrats because they felt betrayed by Lyndon Johnson uh, were seduced to become part of the Republican Party. This is Lee Atwater's that whole polemic that Lee Atwater laid out, where he says we can't use these kinds of words anymore, but if we talk about states' rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we're sort of saying the same thing. So we've been on this path for a long, long, long time, and it has, it's reached a point of, of inflammatory language uh, and incivility and hostility uh, that, is, that, that I've never seen before. And uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, the current president has given license to this kind of language when we have, for example, uh, the, the neo-Nazi march, and he says things like there are good people on both, both sides, sides yeah. or this business of creating boogeymen wherever they are. These, these poor Or the Clinton refugees, boogie woman as well. Yeah, exactly, who are, who are, you know, who are marching up. Th these, these are not... Uh, the, the, the image that the president is giving of these men, that these, you know, these virile men are coming to, to uh, it, it, it reminds me of a scene out of Birth of a Nation. Sure. I mean, they, they, uh, taking up on that note about this caravan coming up uh, uh, that has been politicized, I mean, you, can, you know, we have the deployment of 5,200 troops, I think that was the last count, that uh, are being sent to the Mexico border to counter the arrival of the caravan. Now, that has been blasted by Republicans and top military brass as a waste of valuable resources. Um, will this play, Robert, against uh, Trump's core support, do you reckon, or will it remain unshaken? I don't think it'll play one way or the other. I think the interesting thing about this caravan is something I saw on TV on your sister network, I believe, France von Cadre, yeah. where they interviewed one of the migrant uh, caravan individuals who said he really doesn't want to go to the United States. He wants to stay in Mexico, but he couldn't get the papers. Mm. So I think this is what you're seeing with these people. And I think the government is acting accordingly into mm -hmm. this? Yeah. Oh. You think that this that the reaction is not overplay and it's not being done for political purposes? I, 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 w I wouldn't say political purposes, but a number of things need to be done. This whole issue of this immigration uh, where people can go to Mexico and not be allowed 
to live there are all of a sudden um, looked at as people that everybody can just push to the United States border and say, oh, gee, I want political asylum. Let me in. I mean, if this is the case, anybody from France who wants to go to the U.S. can just get off the plane at Idlewild and say, oh, I want political asylum. I left my passport home and I want to stay here indefinitely. It's, so you're, you're, it's un- odd. you're underlining the right to defend national borders. And this is, this is something that you would, as a Republican, would actually say this, this you can stand over. But what I want to ask uh, about, we touched on this the last time that we, uh, we met, um, Bob. It was um, about bipartisanship. I mean, we, we, we have got Trump's core 40 percent um, support. I mean, and he himself, however, previously described himself as a died of the world Democrat. I mean, this is when yeah. it was politically expedient for him, and he was also very close to the Clintons. I think uh, they were at mm-hmm. one of his weddings at some stage, and there's very famous photos there. But the thing is, is back to that 40%, back to that core Trump um, support that uh, really are the backbone of uh, his presidency, um, his shift to, or his mobilization towards the far right or towards this ultra-conservative bloc, is this now a case of the tail wagging the dog here just for political expediency in it's, Donald Trump's mind? I, I think it might be a little bit of that. Look, this 40% that we're talking about, these are people that are deeply disappointed. Yeah. These are people that, that feel left out. The inequality in America is, is unbelievable. Uh, and, and what the 1% are doing is unconscionable. And these people feel left out, they feel betrayed by traditional politics, and Donald Trump came along and offered them Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a reprise. Uh, None of what he's offered him, he's done. Basically, everything that he's done has favored that 1% that have been ripping off those people. So there are a lot of people that are confused, they're disappointed about this. This is a a politics that's been going on uh, for a long, long, long time in America when, you know, uh, George George Bush Sr. called it voodoo economics when Reagan came along with the idea of the uh, Friedman uh, neoliberalism. And, and what we're seeing is the, is the damage of it mm-hmm. to people's lives. Indeed, the 1%, that the, of course, the 40% that are kind of like the, the muscle, if you will. Yeah. But uh, Bob, what can be done? I mean, a very fair point that Curtis is making. You have that 40% who have been very disappointed over the last, well, decades or whatever it may be. But what can be done to regain the center of American politics? That, uh, that's an interesting question. Maybe we should talk about some of the people in the 1%. And I think the 1%, you mean by 1% of the people of the highest net worth in the country. Sure. And that uh, limitation, when I looked it up, was about 10 million. So now you're looking at people like Barack Obama, who has a net worth north of 40 million, and Bill Clinton even more than that. So maybe they can help us out with uh, explaining how they intend to deal with uh, themselves and their fellow one percenters to become more centrist and inclusive uh, with the poverty that uh, they believe is in America. When you're talking about centrism, you need people on both sides to do things to show that they're centrist. Tip O'Neill and Ron Reagan certainly did this, even though they were very far apart Mm. on the aisle. And it remains to be seen whether Chuck Schumer is going to move towards the center and be cooperative. Perhaps that will happen if the uh, House becomes controlled by the Democrats. Perhaps it won't. It still remains to be seen. Well, it's very difficult. I mean, that's you know, the reason we have the particular situation, map, political map we have in America now is thanks to Tom DeLay, when Tom was the majority leader uh, in the House of Representatives and, and came up with this redistricting plan that guaranteed that Republicans, this is how Republicans uh, got Texas for the first time since uh, uh, Reconstruction, guaranteed that there, the re- certain Republican seats were locked. How do you have, how do you then have a, a door for, for consensus, for compromise for across the aisle when it becomes a political zero-sum game where one political party says, I want all the goodies and those guys are the bad guys, where we are calling our political opposite the enemy. Texas. Would that be the Texas that elected Ann Richards governor? Is that, that the same the, one? The very same Texas. Yeah, the very same that, liberal Texas. That, that Tom DeLay turned around because it was during Ann Richards' administration that he did that, and there hasn't been a Democrat in Texas since. And there hasn't been a Republican in New York City for a long time since Roy Goodman. 
And just tell me, remind us exactly, when was the last time Texas had a Democrat? Uh, I, I, well, Ann Richards was the last uh, uh, governor, uh, Democratic governor of Texas, and the last time we had a, tech, a Democratic representative from Texas was 2000, okay. maybe. 2000, okay. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, that's very much the nitty-gritty. You know all of the old, the old names from the old periods there. But now let's just look at actually what's happening today and the voting. Um, Bob, a quick question to you. Would I be right in saying that one of the biggest fears for Republicans in this midterm election is the mobilization of the women's vote following, we touched on it the last time, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, the debacle that went on there for this, um, the choice of the Supreme Court judges. And of course, there was the Me Too campaign and of course, all of the kind of salacious stuff going on with Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump, but all of these kind of kiss and tell books that are coming out. But the women who have been spoke, who've been talked to and been um, asked questions, two to one ratio will vote Democrat. Is that something to be concerned about for Republicans? Yeah, that's very interesting. I was watching CNBC earlier today, and they said that during the three weeks of the Brett Kavanaugh affair, mm. if you want to call it that, mm. uh, that um, Trump's approval rating went up on the NBC polls from 42 to 47 percent. Because uh, they said, because it's uh, the uh, the limelight was shifted away from him to Brett Kavanaugh, but th that's you know that's that's arguable. Mm. What what the women are going to do? I, we really have to wait and see because mm -hmm. that's that's always a question mark. Really, what you're looking at is where the wealthy are in the suburbs. The wealthy um, are looking towards. It's been. Um, it's been thought that these areas would go Democrat mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the Trump tax plan has hurt the wealthy. Uh, it's been a tax on the rich, mm -hmm. especially in states like New York and New Jersey. And Curtis, yourself, um, what, uh, how, what ace, we're running out of time here, but what ace have the Democrats up their sleeves during this campaign, do you reckon? Beto O'Rourke. O'Rourke. <laughs> Beto O'Rourke down in Texas. Yeah. And do you, do you believe that really that uh, the, the O'Rourke cruise uh, uh, showdown that, uh, that O'Rourke might actually get it? I, I'm, I have a sense that he could pull this off. And what do you think, Bob? I, I think it's very interesting. It's difficult to say. But what, what I find interesting is it's similar to when Ann Richards won. So uh, these people go everywhere. You know, as a very famous uh, psychiatrist said, sometimes a cigar is only a cigar. And that's it. Okay. okay, gentlemen, Curtis Young from Democrats Abroad and Robert Oliver thank from you. Republicans in France. Thank you both so much for coming on the program today. It was great to see you both again in here in studio. And from all of us here at Paris Live PM, that's all we have time for for today. But of course, we're back tomorrow. Same time, same place here on Radio France International. <laughs>